There are a lot of alocasias. There's Amazonica, Bambino, Calidora, Dragon Scale, Ebony, Friday, Green Goddess, Kilo Beauty, Imperial Red, Kuching Mask, Glitter, Bakiana, Maharani, New Guinea, Odora, Platinum, Quilted Dreams, Regal Shield, Serendipity, Tigrina, Velvet, Elvis, Yucatan, Princess, and Zabrina. That's one for every letter of the alphabet, and that's just from our website. I did skip J, U, and X. Let me know in the comments if you know an alocasia that starts with one of those letters. Why are there so many different kinds of alocasias? Well, to answer that, let's start with the basics. What is an alocasia? Taxonomically speaking, alocasia is the genus. Follow that up the ladder and you reach the tribe Colocasii, which sounds a lot like Colocasia. Informally, we refer to alocasias and colocasias as elephant ears, which is basically the layman's term for their shared tribe. As similar as these genuses are, they're generally told apart like this. Colocasias grow to be much larger, prefer more water, are more fragile when they're babies, but stronger than when they're mature. Their leaves tend to point downward, just like this, and so on. Alocasias are more petite, they prefer less water, they're hardier as babies, but more fragile as mature plants, and their leaves tend to point upward. Oh yeah, and most of those wacky leaf shapes, those are all on the alocasia side of the tribe. Now, none of that is true across the board. And taxonomically speaking, what makes them different has nothing to do with what's above the soil line, but what's below it. So right here, I have a Maui Sunrise Colocasia. I'm gonna dig the soil away so that we can see what secrets lie underneath. Here I have a Boa Alocasia. I'm just gonna pull that soil away as well. All right, so I have the Colocasia here on my left and the Alocasia here on my right. Colocasia species are primarily tuberous, meaning they grow from large underground tubers that store nutrients. The tuberous system allows colocasias to regenerate annually and grow vigorously in marshy or aquatic environments. The alocasia, the boa I have over here, these on the other hand are primarily rhizomatous, meaning they grow from rhizomes, AKA underground stems. You can even see that looks like an underground stem. And these stems spread horizontally. Rhizomes allow alocasias to have a more upright, compact growth habitat. You can even see that's even pointing up right there. In the wild, there are dozens of varieties of colocasias, but there are more than 90 alocasia varieties occurring wildly in nature. And botanists are always discovering more. This is due primarily to their diverse natural habitats and adaptations to a wide range of environmental conditions across subtropical and subtropical regions. For example, alocasias in rainforests may have large, bold leaves to capture light, while those in more humid or mountainous environments may have more narrow leaves and colorations to help cope. Now here's the coolest fact about alocasias that I've been dying to tell you about. Many species exhibit what's called morphological plasticity, meaning they can produce different forms of growth depending on factors like light, temperature, or humidity. A single species might look quite different when grown under various conditions. For example, an alocasia that grows in a low light situation might develop more elongated and darker leaves, like the Lauterbachiana. Whereas alocasias that have plenty of light will have these bigger leaves and uh, much greener. Uh, don't ask me why the stingray looks like that. I have no idea how it developed that trait. Thus far, I've only spoken of varieties, which are the kinds of alocasias that occur in nature. But now I'm gonna talk about the cultivars, which are the kinds that man has had a hand in creating. I'm not talking about GMOs. As far as I know, there are no genetically modified alocasias. There wouldn't really be much of a purpose in them pursuing that research. I'm talking about hybridization and selective breeding to bring out desirable traits, such as unique leaf colors, shapes, or more compact growth habits, suitable for indoor environments. Cultivars like Regal Shields and Frydeck are examples of just such cultivation. But how is breeding accomplished? Alocasias are known for their lush foliage, but not so much their flowers, but they do indeed flower. If you've ever seen one, they resemble a spathophyllum or philodendron or anthurium's flowers. All of these plants are related as they belong to the Araceae family. By taking pollen from one alocasia flower and pollinating another plant, hybrids upon hybrids upon hybrids have been created. There's one other way that cultivars are created, sports, which are genetic mutations. Say you propagated a thousand alocasias and one of them looked rare and unique. 
so you took that one and bred it or cloned it to make more of it. I personally know that's how the mojito colocasia came into existence, which is one of our more popular colocasias. So this is the takeaway. There are a lot of different varieties of naturally occurring alocasias because their genetics make them really good at adapting. These numerous varieties give breeders a lot of test subjects to hybridize. And as long as the elephant ear market has money to spare, there will be more and more cultivars created. Now, for five rapid fire fast facts about alocasias. I already talked about how spathophyllums and anthuriums are close relatives of the alocasia, but there is another plant that's even more closely related, caladiums. So closely related, in fact, that the Hilo beauty, you'll sometimes refer to as an alocasia and sometimes as a caladium. Botanists just can't figure out how they're gonna categorize this one. Number two, one reason they're not known for their flowers is because they are small, inconspicuous, and they bloom in the evening. They release a faint, sometimes unpleasant scent to attract pollinators. Number three, while some colocasias are edible, alocasias are not. They contain calcium oxalate crystals, which are toxic to pets and humans. They can cause irritation or swelling in the mouth and digestive system. Both alocasias and colocasias are known for their rapid growth, so they make for interesting time-lapse videos. Check out what I mean in this video right here. Most alocasias live five to 10 years, but the bigger ones can last up to 20. Who knew that that houseplant would be a longer term commitment than your pet? 